I'm Bill Hosley, and I first visited Old Sturbridge Village when I was 10, many years ago. Smitten, I've been back countless times since. I eventually went into museum work and have visited hundreds of museums of every kind. OSV always makes me smile and has been a source of inspiration and fascination, a national treasure. OSV started as a way to present co-founder A.B. Wells' sprawling collections of everyday possessions of rural New England. Inspired by his son George's vision for a living village and assisted financially by his brother, J. Cheney Wells, they embarked on the project in the late 1930s. Prior to that, A.B. Wells displayed his collections in a family mansion in neighboring Southbridge. The brothers acquired a large farm site in Sturbridge and began assembling historic buildings from around the region into a village setting. After World War II, George's wife, Ruth, served as the founding director and glue that propelled the vision forward. They hired a young Harvard grad and antiques expert, Malcolm Watkins, who brought what he learned at OSV to the Smithsonian, where he pioneered an influential style of exhibitry. By 1946, the Outdoor Living History Museum was ready to greet the public, which showed up in such numbers that by 1958 they'd welcomed their millionth guest. The collections are vast and diverse. A sophisticated research library undergirds scholarship, the basis for the authenticity of the OSV experience. From the get-go, media coverage was expansive and enthusiastic. Part of the appeal of OSV is the topography of its setting. The site, with its mill pond, woodlots, rolling terrain, evokes the realism of the pre-industrial age. Its farm settings, orchards and meadows, are photogenic in every season. The mill pond and mill rays power the village's three outstanding mill buildings. The diversity of building forms reflects the 1830s, which eventually became the period the village was programmed and designed to convey. The buildings represent the array of styles and forms you would have found in this part of rural western New England at the time. There is the 1790s mansion of Mr. Salem Town and his family from neighboring Charlton, the Bixby House and Parsonage, Bullard Tavern and the Fitch House, and the Small House that shows how less affluent farm families actually lived. It wouldn't be New England without church on the village green. This bank moved from nearby Thompson, Connecticut, is a building form rarely seen and interpreted. Asa Knight's store is a buzz with shopkeepers and countless items typically found in the 1830s, all painstakingly documented. There is a country law office. These buildings provide settings for live costumed interpretation programs. In the early years, the emphasis was on craft demonstrations, which evolved and now provide state-of-the-art performance in a variety of trades. The tinsmith, the cooper, pottery, shoemaking, a print shop, a blacksmith shop, and soon to be a new cabinet-making shop. Water power was a source of prosperity in rural New England. OSV is the only outdoor living history museum to document so many water-powered mills, including this grist mill. A sawmill and a carding mill adopted early machine processes that eventually moved textile manufacturing from home to factory. Basically what happened is these Scottish brothers came over in the 1770s who had built these machines in Britain and just started building them here. And the idea is just to take the wool and break it up so it's not quite as dense uh, and get it prepared so it can actually be run through the other machines and finished. This machine over here is going to keep the better quality wool coming from the back and the sides of the sheep and turn it into a roll. You would then take that home and spin that. When I push down on this, this is going to open up the head gate allowing the water to flow into the mill. This is a When I actually shift the belt over, that actually engages it. So the wool is slowly coming out of the feed apron on this side. It's going through a series of rollers that actually carrying the wool from one end of the machine to the other one. Best of all, there's farming. The Freeman Farm on the outskirts of the Village Green is a national treasure. Visitors experience gardening in its seasonal rhythms, 
Then there are the animals, including back breeds of the period. Spring lambs are always a fan favorite. Cows, oxen, and hogs. Milking and dairy, both at Freeman Farm and at Mr. Town's house. These were the tractors of the 1830s. Real, live demonstrations are a regular part of the OSV experience. Horse-drawn vehicles are everywhere doing different kinds of work in all seasons. Hearth cooking is the heart of the home, with trained interpreters welcoming guests and explaining kitchen life in 1830s New England. Preparing meat, baking pies and bread, processing milk in the pantry, it's all so colorful and interesting. Other domestic arts practiced by women in the 1830s include cleaning clothes, dyeing fabrics using fascinating natural dyes. Men and women all worked at home on the farm. This is processing wood shingles, fence posts, and posts for framing buildings. In March, it's maple sugar. 40 gallons of sap makes a gallon of syrup. OSV's household interiors are scrupulously researched, furnished, and presented. Mr. Town's house is the epitome of stylish elegance from the 1790s. The settings also function as stage sets for dramatized programs and interpretation. House tours are occasionally scheduled. OSV is famous for its period reproduction wallpapers and window treatments. No one does it better. Even the gardens are based on painstaking research. In recent years, OSV has showcased and developed big events and dramatizations that have been hugely popular, like Evening of Illumination, which brings the village to life at night, and features holiday decor. Seasonal rhythms and work change with the calendar. Rebels in Redcoats breaks from the 1830s, but is the best gathering of reenactors in New England. Celebrating the 4th of July 1830s style, complete with militia drills and cannon fire. Oratory and parades. There are vintage car rallies. Winter sleigh rallies. Winter warmth and cheer is an opportunity to observe young people getting dolled up for a ball, featuring hairstyles from the period. Apple harvesting at the cider mill is unique, colorful, and aromatic. Visits by the Native American medicine doctor and abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison bring the period to life. Plenty of period games and dress-up for the kids. Scheduled music and an itinerant magician. The fall agricultural fair transforms the church into a display of agricultural produce and domestic arts. The annual citizenship ceremony is welcoming America at its best. Increasingly, OSV is about performing arts, using the campus as a stage for special events. The Cider Festival brings vendors together from throughout New England to showcase their specialty drinks. Big theatricals like Charlotte's Web and Sleepy Hollow, a legendary outdoor experience, have drawn sold-out crowds. OSV also produces wonderful changing exhibitions that deep dive into aspects of the 1830s, this one on rural cabinet making, another on the history of OSV and the development of its collections, and quilts, not just as art, but as a way to understand domestic economy and recycling. The depth of its collections of common everyday household objects sets OSV apart. A collection of hammers? Who knew? OSV has a rare and outstanding collection of rural farmscapes, portraits, one including this cabinet maker, a Tilly Mead of Hardwick, Mass. They've got painted trade signs, tavern signs, and fireboards, chairs of all kinds, cabinet work, and this wonderful stencil and grain painted bedstead, women's art, needlework, hook rugs, and bandboxes. New England made redware, stoneware, and imported ceramics of the period. The glass gallery is extraordinary and echoes the Wells family's involvement manufacturing eyeglasses. Firearms and militariana presented in state-of-the-art gallery settings adjoin the village campus.
The J. Cheney Wells Clock Gallery is filled with horological treasures beautifully presented. The heart of Old Sturbridge Village is education. In the 1970s, they built an education center to accommodate school groups. It's the gold standard for hands-on learning. Summer camps and special events for kids. Recently, OSV founded Old Sturbridge Academy, a Massachusetts charter school that is blazing new trails in experiential learning. What I love most is the audience, the demographics of OSV's fans, friends, and visitors. It's a family museum in the truest sense, and it appeals to a wider spectrum of people by age, race, and gender of any museum I know, an audience that truly looks like America as it teaches and inspires an understanding of America's past. Family fun and parents with snugglies, veterans and military service celebrations, scout groups and school groups, young, old, and a great place to take a date. Best of all are the on-site costumed interpreters, men and women of all ages devoted to portraying the past by keeping it real. I call OSV my happy place. If you've never been, run, don't walk. If you haven't been in a while, well, every visit is a unique experience because the seasons change and this show is always in motion.